Welcome everyone to this Market Links webinar. This webinar is entitled Beyond the Basics, Integrating Psychosocial Support into Enterprise and Employment Programming. Uh, before we begin our event, I just would like to remind everyone that you are muted by default. Uh, there will be an uh, audience Q&A towards the end of the event, but if you have any questions at any point during the presentation, feel free to enter those into the Q&A box, which you can find um, in the menu at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also type them in the chat, um, although it might be a little bit more difficult for us to capture those. Um, we will be monitoring the chat and the Q&A box throughout the presentation uh, to make sure that we can capture your questions for the speakers to address during the Q&A portion. Okay, so without further ado, I will turn it over to our moderator, Laura Meisner, Economic Recovery and Markets Advisor at USAID. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, we are really delighted to have so many guests from all around the world come to listen to this. I think this is a really special panel and I'm really excited about it. Um, as Lisa said, my name is, or sorry, as Laura said, my name is Laura Meisner and I work with USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance through an agreement with the University of Arizona. I'm a senior economic recovery and markets advisor there. So today we are going to be talking about how to integrate psychosocial support into enterprise and employment programming in crisis affected contexts. Um, USAID's Office of US Foreign Disaster Assistance, which is now part of VHA, um, last year in fiscal year 20, provided almost $36 million to economic recovery and market systems programming. Um, we also funded protection sector activities in over 35 countries. Many of those included psychosocial support. Investing in people's livelihoods and supporting critical market systems can both help support people's ability to provide for themselves, support the critical markets that supply the goods and services that people need, and well-designed psychosocial support programming can help prevent further deterioration in health status, help prevent the dissolution of social fabric, support when households have lost income earners, and prevent other consequences. These are both really critical parts of recovering from crises. However, as we've all found out from personal experience this year, if not before, it's really hard to give your all at work when things around you are in upheaval. Many of us this past year have ourselves dealt with anxiety, sadness, loneliness, grief, and more living through the COVID pandemic. People who live through armed conflict, displacement, major natural disasters, and more may very naturally also be struggling mentally and emotionally. Loss of a livelihood or job is of course itself another significant stressor on individuals and families, and it's critical to address in humanitarian programming. Discussion groups, group information sessions, and individual counseling are all activities that can be incorporated into livelihoods programs to improve both economic and psychosocial outcomes. It's essential to gain an understanding of the context and the situation not just of people's needs and gaps, but also the strengths and skills of families in the community. There are pros and cons to different kinds of interventions that we should take into account to ensure that our interventions can decrease stress. And it's also critical to make sure that livelihood staff are trained on the basics of mental health and psychosocial support so that they can identify those who are in need of more structured support and then refer them to those services. A number of agencies have been taking a holistic view to this. We've been offering a range of interventions from community support groups to trainings on life skills and healthy coping mechanisms to more structured kinds of psychological support and counseling right alongside those more traditional economic interventions of business grants, job training and placement, savings groups, and other such economic interventions. But this isn't easy. How can we ensure that each component is delivered by trained staff with the right skills? Can we prove whether the added cost and time of delivering this kind of integrated package is worth it in terms of improved outcomes? And what does this really look like in different contexts? Today, to try and answer some of that, we are bringing you three organizations with a wealth of experience. The International Rescue Committee, or IRC, will discuss their work in South Sudan, 
with women's and youth groups working on financial inclusion, new enterprise and employment development, and prevention and response to gender-based violence and more. Action Against Hunger will discuss their tiered support and referral model that works in Iraq and elsewhere alongside their economic recovery interventions. And Catholic Relief Services will share their work in Central America with youth in areas with a high risk of violence and justice involved individuals, as well as their data on cost effectiveness. We have an amazing group of speakers today for you who I will just briefly introduce everybody and then we'll go into the presentation. Brian Sasabunya is the IRC's Enterprise Development and Employment Senior Technical Advisor. He's based at the IRC hub in Nairobi and has over 15 years of professional work experience with market systems and private sector development in both emergency recovery and development contexts throughout Africa and the Middle East. Benson Adoko, also with IRC, is the Economic Recovery and Development Technical Coordinator for South Sudan. He also is the leader of IRC's South Sudan Country Emergency Team and a co-chair of the South Sudan Agricultural Technical Working Group. With Action Against Hunger, we have Lara Kolache, who is the Food Security and Livelihoods Regional Technical Advisor in charge of the Middle East. She has 20 years of experience in the Middle East context, including fieldwork in Palestine, Egypt, Ebanon, Iraq, and Jordan, among others. And we have Alexandra Letzelter, who is in charge of mental health, care practices, gender, and protection for the Middle East region. He's a clinical psychologist who has over 20 years experience in France and Canada as a therapist and a consultant particularly focused on individuals affected by mental health disorders, families, marginalized youth, people struggling with addiction, and um, company employees. And he has been with ACF since 2010. With Catholic Relief Services, we have Kay Andrade Ekoff. She is the Regional Advisor for Youth Employability, currently based in El Salvador. She has over 30 years of experience focused on Central America and as an expert in employability, leadership with youth, cognitive behavioral interventions, migration and violence prevention and peace building. Juan Carlos Duran is the advisor for monitoring, evaluation, accountability and learning with CRS in the LAC regional office. And he has been leading monitoring and evaluation components for different youth, different youth livelihoods programs in El Salvador and Honduras for over five years. Um, without any further, as you can see, we have an incredible amount of expertise here for you. I would now like to turn it over to Brian and Benson to talk about the IRC's work in South Sudan. Um, hello to you all. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Brian Sevunya. I'm a senior technical advisor in the Economic Recovery and Development Technical Unit at the IRC, the International Rescue Committee. I thank the USAID Market Links team for the invitation to this discussion. I'll be talking about IRC's experiences of integrating livelihoods and gender-based violence response, specifically focusing on our recent work in South Sudan. As a result, I'm joined by my colleague, Benson Adoko from the IRC South Sudan Country Program. I'll let him introduce himself later during the presentation. Next slide, please. In this presentation, we shall briefly talk about uh, the South Sudan context, specifically focusing on livelihoods and GBV prevalence, then have a specific deep dive into the integrated livelihoods and GBV program where we apply the IRC's EASE approach, as I will explain later, and then close with some um, lessons and uh, some results and lessons learned from this experience. Next slide, please. Some, some background about the context in South Sudan. Since July 2011, when South Sudan officially obtained independence as the youngest country in Africa, it has gone through a number of crises, conflict, drought, floods, and recently the locusts, leading to the third largest refugee crisis after Syria and Afghanistan. Nearly 4 million people remain displaced, including about 1.5 million Interna internally displaced, and about 2.2 million refugees. 
Over the years, the country has faced macroeconomic decline in form of hyperinflation, recurrent conflicts and natural shocks leading to displacement, uh, disruption of market system, and loss of livelihoods and assets. As a result, about 7.5 million people in South Sudan need aid, over 6 million on the brink of famine. There are few livelihood opportunities, limited skills and training opportunities, as well as limited access to financial services to aid any investments. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Specifically looking at GBV, in a survey conducted by IRC prior to, to this project that we are here to present to you, 49% of the households identified GBV as a high risk. The same number of affected women and girls have no access to GBV services, and only 12% of the community have awareness on the availability of GBV services. 29% of GBV survivors need, in need of safe houses did not obtain the service because the services are not there. As you can see in the chart, physical assault is reported as the most prevalent form of GPV at 39% of the reported cases, according to the National GPV Management Information System. Other forms of abuse include rape, forced marriage, and many others. Of course, in a context like this, conflict and other crises exacerbate violence against women and girls, coupled with the disproportionate cultural norms that leave women vulnerable to abuse and limit their economic potential and growth opportunities. <clears throat> Next slide, please. The IRC's economic and social empowerment is evidence-based motto is specifically designed to support women in such contexts. It includes the Village Savings and Loan Association, which is to enable women to have a safe place to mobilize savings and access loans and have access to an insurance fund for emergencies. This is supported with uh, the discussion group series as a tool for social norms change between members and their spouses on shared decision making. It's a nine part discussion series. It's not a training, it's a discussion where spouses are invited to join the VSLM members normally after a saving meeting to discuss and share experiences based on a, a given set of open-ended questions. And these sessions are normally facilitated by a trained facilitator. In addition, um, the third component is the business skills training, which is geared towards helping women to acquire business skills and knowledge to start or expand their business activities. Here, we mainly use the competence-based economy through formation of enterprises, CFA, curriculum to facilitate experiential-based learning, which is important for adult learners, but other business skills curricula can also be used. In terms of sequencing, uh, normally after establishing the groups, then we start uh, filtering uh, the, the other two components based on the context and uh, how the, the groups are, have, have been organized. Next slide, please. In terms of the ease theory of change, the high level goal is to ensure women safely exercise decision making power and control over economic resources. And women experience reduced violence from their intimate partners. To achieve that, women should feel supported by their peers and women should have access to economic resources, both of which are supported by the BSLA intervention. Additionally, to achieve the, the broad outcome, women need a diversified source of income. The business skills training is specifically contributing to this. And lastly, women need to safely voice their priorities and participate in decisions that affect them. And that's how the group discussion series comes in. With this introduction, allow me now to invite my colleague Benson to tell us about the recently concluded project in South Sudan where this model has been applied. Thank you. Benson, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Brian, for the introduction and thank you, colleagues. Uh, before I go into the slides, I just want to say that uh, IRC has been in South Sudan for over 30 years, uh, since 1989. And uh, we operate in the IDP, within the IDP comes refugee and host community settings. And our programs cover health, safety, economic 
uh, well-being, which is the livelihoods component, uh, where we will be sharing our experience around today. In terms of the OFDA-funded livelihoods and GBV inter integrated response, uh, this one-year project was implemented in, in Unity State of South Sudan. And I will look at basically the integration elements between livelihoods and GBV response services. Uh, the project had three core components. Uh, one of them is the uh, strengthening market systems, uh, which involved uh, you know, facilitating cash for work activities, uh, focused on rehabilitation of market roads, uh, market footpaths, uh, flood control channels, uh, and also construction of uh, market sheds for women who are dealing in foodstuffs or you know, fresh foods within the markets. Uh, the other component is the EASE, which Brian already mentioned. And through the EASE program, uh, we were able to support 30 women-led groups, uh, you know, with VSLA trainings and inputs, uh, but also facilitated discussion group series between the VSLA women uh, and their spouses, and also, uh, you know, conducted business skills training and this component was integrated with some of the you know, psychosocial support activities that we will be looking at. Uh, the third component is the complementary livelihood skills uh, you know, support, uh, where we facilitated uh, you know, skills training and provided grants for, for youths and GBV survivors. Uh, for GBV survivors, basically, the focus was also on ensuring that they uh, have a safe place where they can you know, engage in uh, you know, skills building activities as part of their psychosocial uh, you know, healing. And so uh, skills on embroidery, crocheting and hairdressing were among us, some of those that were you know, supported and facilitated within the women's spaces. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So in order to augment on women's uh, access to psychosocial uh, support and GBV response needs, uh, the project integrated GBV response services uh, for women and girls. Uh, and this particularly included uh, you know, capacity building for GBV uh, case workers on GBV case management. Uh, a total of 157 uh, case workers were trained across the state. Uh, the other, you know, complementary activity was also on comprehensive case management of GPV survivors, uh, where we provided psychosocial support and uh, linked to the health component of this program, where uh, clinical care, you know, for GPV survivors as well. The other is on the, you know, psychosocial support, uh, you know, uh, for GPV survivors, you know, to ensure trauma healing. Uh, you know, processes. As I said, this was linked to the skills building activities as an element of empowerment for women, uh, but also to ensure they recover and are able to reintegrate uh, within the community. So about uh, 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 210 survivors were supported and 32 of these were minors children uh, who were able to receive these services. Material support, especially for vulnerable women, GBV uh, survivors, uh, was also provided in the form of dignity kits uh, that you know, the vulnerable women and survivors could use. The last is the behavioral change messaging, uh, which took shape in terms of you know, community uh, dialogues, uh, messaging, uh, and also engaging you know, women uh, and, and, and men to discuss issues around GBV, early and forced marriages, uh, and strengthening customer record systems. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So in this slide, we are basically looking at the results, you know, based on our end line, uh, you know, project performance evaluation. Uh, a number of results we are, we are, we are noted. Uh, one is the improved access 
and safety around the, the local marketplaces. Women, particularly through uh, you know their focus group discussions, indicated that they uh, they felt that the, the marketplaces were safer, and so they could easily access uh, the, the the market. Uh, the other is the attainment of business skills and ability to start own income generating activities. Uh, about you know uh, from the women's uh, skills building activities. Uh, and also their participation in BSLAs, uh, the women were able to borrow savings from the groups and be able to start their you know, business businesses. And 73% of these, uh, those who started businesses reported to have increased net incomes uh, within the, the year. The other is also the uh, you know, ability to increase savings, especially for women involved in BSLAs, about 21% of the members, you know, were able to, to save money uh, and also experience increased savings. 48% accessed credits, you know, for small businesses, as I indicated already. Uh, about 30% of the women in the BSLAs also participated in the uh, cash for work activities. And through that, they were able to receive, you know, temporary, you know, incomes, uh, and also which boosted their savings uh, and also meeting other basic needs such as food and other items. Uh, there was also a notable, uh, you know, increase in the number of, I mean, the percentage of women who reported uh, to be feeling safe and psychologically, you know, you know comfortable within their homes. Uh, about 64% of the women reported this, and this they attributed to the, uh, you know, their involvement in livelihoods activities. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. I will leave this to Brian to to take over. Over to you, Brian. Thank you so much, Benson. <clears throat> Um, in conclusion, I would like to share some takeaways uh, that we, we've gathered from these experiences. Number one, um, from the women's safe and friendly spaces, we found that these are good places to nurture livelihood activities, especially the peer support that women get from, their, from, uh, from the members, helps them with confidence and uh, the freedom to express themselves, both of which are very key for entrepreneurship. Secondly, uh, the GBV response that we provide needs to not to be only a one-off activity in order to improve women's resili resilience. Women need to be assured of, of, of their continued access to GBV services as and when they need them. This was actually a challenge for this short-term project. However, through a training of a number of case workers, as well as community engagements, including local leaders, and of course, linkage to other ongoing activities, we try to ensure that continuity in service provision uh, can be achieved. Thirdly, economic empowerment of women is hard to achieve without targeting their spouses. We know that this is very true everywhere, even where we're sitting right now, uh, but very important in these highly patriarchal societies. It's of course a challenge sometimes to get male spouses interested, but for example, use of male champions to encourage other men or encouraging the BSL members to invite their spouses, Basically, depending on the context, different approaches can be used, but the bottom line is that spouses are very critical in uh, supporting their, the women to, in their journey for economic empowerment. And lastly, uh, but not least, yeah, we, we emphasize the issue of uh, holistic livelihoods approaches. In a context like this, where people have gone through various traumatizing events, both physical, mental, and emotional needs, need to be addressed in case we are to be successful. Next slide, please. We, we generally wrap up our presentation in this one um, general statement that, especially in a fragile context like South Sudan, where people have gone through many horrible events in their lives, it's not enough to provide skills and assets as we all traditionally do, but we need to provide psychosocial support for emotional and mental recovery, preparing the ground for enterprise development. And this is specifically necessary, especially when we are to target women 
and I think we should do that. Thank you so much for the presentation, for, for, the, for listening to our presentation. Over to you, Laura. All right, thank you so much, Brian and Benson. I'd like to turn it now to Lara and Alexandre to talk about Action Against Hunger's work in Iraq. Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Lara Colace. I am the technical advisor for food security and livelihoods in uh, Action Against Hunger in France. Thank you for the invitation and uh, Alex. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Alexandre Letzelter, the mental health uh, technical advisor for uh, Action Against Hunger in Middle East. Uh, Lara and I will talk today about an integrated approach combining livelihoods, mental health and psychosocial support. I will mention MHPSS in the presentation. Uh, approach that uh, Action Against Hunger has developed particularly in Iraq and focused on creating job opportunities and improving well-being and resilience of crisis affected population including host communities refugees and internally displaced persons next slide please so why such approach uh, there are growing growing evidence that uh, mental health and poverty uh, interact in a negative cycle in low and middle income countries uh, on one side uh, mhpss issues uh, prevent and limit the ability of individuals to learn and to engage in productive activities in the other hand poverty is a risk factor for mhpss issues so there are uh, two causal pathways, one uh, related to social causes, where uh, conditions of poverty exacerbate existing psychosocial vulnerabilities, uh, for example, increased risk of stress, trauma, social exclusion, malnutrition, violence, substance abuse, as well, it limits access to services. There is also a social drift uh, meaning that people with psychosocial vulnerabilities are at increased risk of drifting into or remaining in poverty through decreased daily functional abilities, increased health expenditure, reduced pro productivity, stigma, loss of employment and earnings. So we thought that interventions are needed, of course, to break uh, this circle. A uh, lot of uh, our projects uh, showed already that uh, strengthening mental uh, resilience can contribute to improve economic status and strengthening socioeconomic status can improve well-being. So a joint livelihood and MHPSS programming allow creating an empowering, an empowering environment. Next slide, please. And over to you, Lara. What we concretely uh, do, which kind of activities? We generally start with an assessment phase, uh, including uh, stakeholders mapping, households assessment, mental health and psychosocial support assessment. And of course, we assess the labor market from supply and demand side. Then we go through uh, the beneficiary selection according to tailored uh, vulnerability criteria. All our beneficiaries uh, attend a life social and emotional skills training uh, and they follow accompaniment by the psychosocial workers. Then the beneficiaries we follow uh, two different pathways. The first one is uh, according to uh, employment pathways or an apprenticeship scheme. Uh, they attend an employability skills training, uh, they will be placed in company which, which are pre-identified and with which Action Against Anger sign uh, agreements, a memorandum of understanding, and uh, with which we, uh, as Action Against Anger, co-share uh, the cost of the salary. The other pathways for the other 
beneficiaries goes through uh, the uh, entrepreneurship and business pathway. So uh, beneficiaries receive business skills training, they develop a business plan, and they are provided with financial grants, uh, generally provided in two tranches. Beneficiaries of the two pathways uh, are followed up uh, along the duration of the program and their working integration by uh, psychosocial support workers and uh, livelihoods uh, technicians. Then uh, the capitalization process end up with, uh, with uh, lesson learned generally. After five months uh, from the end of the project, we generally carried out a performance uh, uh, post-project uh, uh, survey. Next slide, please. So as Lara has mentioned, uh, the beneficiaries of the livelihood components um, will attend life social emotional skills training. Uh, so we use the WHO definition of life skills, uh, referring to the acquisition of the 10 psychosocial competencies like communication skills, uh, self-confidence, self-esteem, critical thinking, uh, interpersonal skills, and so on. Um, we also monitor the improvement of the participant to this uh, life social and emotional skills training through specific scales, like the life skills assessment uh, and some uh, mental health and communication um, assessment. Uh, then the participants are invited uh, to attend uh, at least a free individual or small group session to strengthen specific uh, life, social and emotional skills uh, in order to accompany their uh, business plan or uh, apprenticeship plan. Uh, through this uh, component, we screen also uh, the beneficiaries with uh, high uh, vulnerabilities or at uh, risks for uh, protection or uh, mental health issues. And uh, they are proposed to join uh, our uh, clinical uh, psychoeducation sessions or group, uh, as you can see uh, for the option one. Uh, the psychoeducation uh, session is uh, related to uh, what is mental health, to identification of uh, signs of distress, to where to seek for a referral, uh, also including some uh, self-help uh, grounding techniques. Uh, for uh, the, we screen also the most vulnerable of them through this psychoeducation session. And they are invited to join uh, six sessions MHPSS uh, group, um, which are uh, done by psychologists uh, or psychosocial uh, workers and based on a um, cognitive and behavioral therapy uh, protocol. Uh, we also monitor uh, improvements of uh, beneficiary uh, through different uh, mental health and resilience scales. And for the very most vulnerable of them, uh, they can also benefit from uh, psychological uh, individual uh, follow-up. Uh, there is a second option that we can propose uh, in some uh, programs as well. Instead of the clinical uh, approach, we can also propose a problem-solving approach using mainly the WHO Problem Management Plus which is a scalable intervention of five sessions uh, in order to solve emotional and practical uh, problems, including as well some uh, mental health and daily functioning scales. And of course, all along the project, uh, the referral system is operational um, for uh, inviting people uh, to address their needs uh, with partners and uh, governmental services. Next slide, please. Few words to uh, contextualize our approach and our experience uh, in Iraq. Iraq is a humanitarian uh, 
situation in which uh, we do we did have uh, Syrian influx, uh, refugee influx from Syria, uh, occupation of uh, Islamic states in 2017, creation of the IDP problem, and uh, the, the last one uh, crisis, of course, COVID-19 crisis, a pandemic affecting the overall economic situation. The people in need in Iraq are 4 million uh, between IDP, refugees and returnees, which, are, which counts the, 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 the latter, 4.7 million. People in need of any kind of assistance are, as livelihoods are 2.4 million and 3 0.8 million and are in need of uh, physical and mental well-being. So our strategy in Iraq is to try to uh, create also job opportunity, of course, um, and rehabilitate, working on the livelihoods, working on the market rehabilitation, and as said uh, uh, before by Alexander, targeting uh, host communities, IDPs, uh, returnees and refugees, and mainly young women and young men. Next slides. So far, we have targeted uh, mainly urban areas uh, in the northern part of Iraq, both in Kurdistan and in federal Iraq. So we carried out six different projects and we built on uh, each of the project uh, one after the other. We targeted um, and uh, we targeted cities as uh, uh, Zaho, Dahuk, Acre, uh, Erbil and Sulemania in uh, Kurdistan, uh, uh, in the north of part of Kurdistan, and then in federal Iraq, Mosul, Sinjar and Kayara. Next slides, please. Uh, just to take an example from uh, one of the biggest uh, projects that we had in Mosul, uh, as you can see, uh, the number of uh, targeted beneficiaries in the two different pathways are more or less similar. The difference uh, uh, that we can uh, uh, consider is that generally women uh, are much more uh, interested to the apprenticeship pathway, so to the employment uh, components, less than, more than the pathways in, uh, in, in business or entrepreneurship uh, uh, creation. Uh, all of them, in any case, receive, as said above, uh, social life and emotional skills. Uh, up to Alexander to compliment. Yes, thank you, Lara. Um, I have more comment on the MHPSS support uh, part, uh, but just to mention that uh, we have a similar ratio between apprenticeship and uh, business pathway uh, for the MHPSS uh, support, which is also uh, consistent with uh, our regular projects, where between 40 to 50 percent of people are in need of uh, MHPSS uh, after awareness sessions. Next slides. Uh, as said, uh, after five months of each project, and now we assessed more, uh, most of our project, uh, we, we really, uh, we really see and and uh, and uh, evaluate that the business pathways has a bigger performance, meaning that after five months, after the end of the project, almost 70-80% of the, of the beneficiaries still are running a business. Less, uh, less exceptional, let's say, less, less big is the rate for apprenticeship pathway, which is a, a, a bit more complicated and affected by different other factors. Up to Alexander. Compliment, yeah. please. Thank, thank you, Lara. Just to mention as well that uh, both for life skills uh, component and uh, the MHPSS uh, clinical component, we have up to 70% of uh, improvement regarding uh, well being or uh, reduc uh, reduction of uh, depression and anxiety symptomatology. Um, so in fact, we have between 70 and 85%. So based on uh, mental health and resilience scales. Next slide, please. 
In terms of uh, best practices, lesson learned that we can uh, we can consider after uh, so many years, uh, we do have uh, uh, something regarding uh, women inclusion in, uh, in 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 our in our in our programs. Uh, we uh, are ready to develop much more specific and tailored solutions to include women um, in, uh, in the different pathways, in the different components. Uh, for example, uh, um, providing more flexible hours, providing uh, different type of contract, uh, of course, not full time, for example, but part time. And then uh, we, uh, we have to focus and we focus much more on networking in order them to be, uh, to be able to, uh, to, to carry out their activities, both in searching a uh, uh, job uh, and in continuing their business uh, uh, activity. In terms of uh, local partnership, uh, this is something that we the, we partially partially developed, but we need to develop the, uh, a little bit more, uh, both uh, partnering with public entities and private entities. Entities. One example is to liaise, for example, with uh, uh, the banking system of the of, of of the area of the area of intervention, where we can um, replace for example, the grants distribution with uh, access to credits. Um, we, we are focusing much more on uh, um, less educated uh, beneficiaries who, are, who have, of course, uh, um, less opportunity to, to, to access the job market. And uh, uh, we are targeting much more returnees in their place of origin. Over to Alexander. Thank you, Lara. Uh, just also to mention that we are working on uh, better sectorial integration uh, as conducting activities and uh, monitoring together uh, uh, activities uh, such as assessment, joint activity, uh, integrated team um, uh, could be interesting. Uh, favoring a solving problem approach uh, versus clinical approach. Also integrating uh, action against hunger approach on baby friendly space for pregnant and lactating women with children under two. Uh, daycare uh, for older children uh, could give more flexibility to women as well uh, to integrate more and more gender and protection consideration. So to end this presentation, uh, there is really an added value to have two sectors working together for uh, mutual benefits and beneficiary benefits. Um, and it's time now to focus on optimizing operational integration and scaling up. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Alexandre and Nair. We will now move from Iraq to Central America and I will turn it over to Juan Carlos Senke. Good morning or afternoon or even good night for, to everyone. My name is Juan Carlos Duran and I work for Catholic Relief Services in El Salvador. We thank the Market Links community for the invitation to share our experience, our experience implementing youth programs in the Northern Triangle of Central America. We hope that our learnings and experiences could be relevant for your program as well. And I know we're the, we the last presentation, so to keep you engaged, we're going to ask questions along the way that you will need to ask to respond to in the chat. So please be prepared. Next slide, please. The intervention and participants. Uh, youth in the Northern Triangle of Central America face several challenges to fully develop their potential. Our programming targets youth that live in conditions that undermine their ability to have access to economic opportunities. Some of the conditions or obstacles include uh, residing in urban neighborhoods with gang presence or high crime prevalence. Exposed to violence is something very usual for them. High rates of youth who have dropped out of school without completing high school. Limited access to formal employment and at these neighborhoods, youth often report 
uh, facing issues with law enforcement and have family members incarcerated. So before moving to our next slide, put in the chat box a why if your program participants are similar or has some similarities with those that I have described or a name if they are if they aren't. Thanks, Kate, for your reply. Thanks, Caroline. Thanks, Rosa. Next slide, please. The program. With CRS, uh, we have uh, noticed that these conditions affect youth access to economic opportunities, as well as their mental health and development. So CRS has been implementing the youth build model, which is a holistic approach. Among the key aspects of the programs are uh, vocational training, life and job skills training, leadership and services, employment and self-employment supporting services. The program has a duration between six months of training plus six months of placement services. And I wanna highlight this, uh, the program has a strong focus on building a culture of resilience and a sense of belonging be among the participants. Next slide, please. What about the employment and education outcomes? Uh, the results have been positive. A cohort study that we carried out over four year period shows that there has been a consistent increase in the percentage of youth placing a job, self-employment, or returning to school after completing the program. As we can see in the bar chart to, the, to your left, seven out of 10 participants were not employed or in school at the start of the program. You can see it in the, in the darker uh, part of the, of the bar at your, at your left. And this percentage falls to less than three out of 10 after one year of program completion and the rate remains stable. At your right, you will see a, a, a graph that depicts that an increases in the reported income of almost 50% of the per, uh, of the value of the 50% from the baseline to eight, eight, 18 months after program completion. There is an increase for you, for both young men and young women, although a gap still remains for income among young women. Next slide, please. Although those positive results, labor markets are very fragile and particularly for youth. Youth move in and out of employment, is something that we have seen. So youth need to be prepared for these setbacks that they will face in these conditions. And this chart shows that among all participants who have placed in jobs, you can see it in the, in the bar, which is just right in the middle, more than a half reported to be unemployed or out of school at least one time during the tracking period. So we are seeing that the labor market is fragile. So sometimes you are in the labor market and sometimes you are out. Uh, next slide, please. So we have also found uh, that regardless of their employment status, Participants rank the soft skills as the most useful uh, of the skills of the training that they got. And this perception remains in time. So that, that's a powerful uh, insight that we found in a, our programming. Next slide, please. And with this chart, uh, we wanna show a uh, how the three key components of our program relate and the perception that participants have. Uh, in, each, in each vortex of the triangle, you have three different uh, components. In the vortex A, you have life, life skills. In the vortex B, you have technical training. In the vortex C, you have post-graduation support. So please type in the chat box if your programming has a component A, B, or C. And if, if you can put it in the chat box, please. Thanks. 
things. I can see that many, many of you have at least one or two components. So in this chart, uh, participants were asked to, uh, to allocate a dot in the area in which they think is the most relevant component. And you can see the larger dot is in the, right in the middle, but kind of lines toward the vortex A, which is consistent with the, uh, with the findings in the previous late, the slide, in which participants were highlighting the relevance of the life skills training. So how we have done this in our programming, I wanted to hand it, all, uh, hand it over to my colleague, Kay Andrade, who is going to share one of, of how we do this. Kay, with you, please. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, next slide, Laura. Um, so for our life skills component, what we did was we developed a specialized life skills curriculum called I Am Ready. Um, it's a curriculum created for use in this program. Um, it's an evidence-based, trauma-informed, cognitive behavioral curriculum. And we're not doing therapy, but it is based on cognitive behavioral therapy. Next slide. Um, the curriculum includes both the components of what we teach, but then also instructional strategies specifically designed to work with vulnerable young people, especially those that may have faced trauma. Um, so it combines both the what as well as the how. Next slide. Um, please type 16 um, in your chat box. Uh, that 16 represents the 16 units. Uh, the 16 units are intentionally designed because we know that it takes about 16 weeks uh, to develop behavioral change if you're deliberately practicing. Uh, so this curriculum was 16 weeks long, 16 units, um, including both an awareness lesson and a transformation lab. Next slide. The first half of this curriculum focuses on intrapersonal skills um, and the second half on interpersonal skills with um, unit 16 being kind of a celebration of looking back at the achievements that um, young people have gained over the life of the, the program. Next slide. And like I mentioned, um, with it are embedded the instructional strategies that are also particularly important to use with young people, um, particularly with vulnerable young people that have been expo exposed to trauma, um, as many of our young people have in Central America. Next slide. So, um, Please type in your chat box a question mark or a dollar sign with a question mark. So that represents, you know, is this effective and how much does this cost? Um, because as all of us are describing, these are integral approaches, right? And they require a more substantial advancement. And so we carried out a cost study to try and better understand the cost, cost effectiveness and cost benefit. Next slide. So we did this because there are more and more programs and more actors that are competing for resources, um, competing for jobs, and sometimes we're even competing for the same young people to participate in our programs. And we needed to understand the effectiveness, um, the cost of the program, its cost effectiveness, the benefits, as well as the, how long it takes to generate a return on investment. Next slide. So we compared three versions of our youth build program across four countries of Central America and 10 implementing partners. We used two years of performance and financial data and the research team was able to analyze the cost per youth enrolled, per youth graduated and placed in a job, self-employment or returning to school. And if you want more information about this particular study, um, the Market Links team has placed links to our policy papers um, on their website or reach out to us and we'll be free to um, send them to you. Next slide. So 
the benefit analysis took into account direct benefits from increases to salaries among the youth um, based on whether or not they got a job, started a business, or returned to school. And it also took into account indirect benefits by calculating the savings um, by avoiding incarceration among those youth with a criminal justice record. And the researchers found that after five years, a $1 investment generated $2.43 in benefits. Next slide. Please type a four in your chat box. Um, so this represents the four key elements um, in order to succeed. Um, so we know that this program now is cost effective and you can gain, um, achieve a return on investment after three years, but it's important to focus on these four elements. So I'm gonna go through those real quickly. The first one, next slide. The first one is um, your investment is lost if your young people drop out of the program. And so for more vulnerable young people, this means guaranteeing that they can be successful. That means providing the critical life skills and social emotional support, but it also means increasing probably your investment um, for young mothers that need childcare or um, stipends for some of the poorest young people. Next slide. Number two, um, training is not the only obstacle um, young people in Central America face when trying to find a job, start their own business, or return to school. So placement services after graduation are critical, and it's actually the only way you can really guarantee that you're going to obtain a return on your investment. Next slide. Number three is working with more excluded young people, especially those in conflict with the law. Um, actually improves your rate of return. But again, that's gonna require a higher return on um, a higher investment um, and in particular, real support on the psychosocial support, real focus on the psychosocial support. Next slide. Um, this is the last one, type four in your chat box for me. Um, four again, yes. Uh, Finally, relationships are critical. Those relationships between the staff and the young people, between the staff and the private sector, and then even among the implementing team. And I think that's um, something that is uh, often overlooked, the relationship among the implementing team for success. Next slide. Our final takeaway is that um, investing in these holistic, the psychosocial and employability training and support programs for young people um, not only produces the results that we need to see, but it's also worth it. Thank you very much. Laura. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, we are now going to invite our panelists to be on video. Um, hopefully this will not crash our system, but if you, like me, have to share your Wi-Fi with others, uh, feel free to hop off video and just be on audio if that's easier. Um, so thank you to all of our presenters and thank you also to the folks who have been posting questions. If you haven't done so and you have a question, please feel free to do it now. Um, Lawyer Tatiana, could you organize us to gallery view um, or just exit the presentation so that we can have people's faces up? Um, perfect. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, so we will now start to take some questions. We have about half an hour. And as I said, if you haven't had the chance to post yet, please feel free to do so now. Um, so one of our first questions, there were a couple of folks, including Julie Kohler and Meta Carlson, who wanted to ask about how are male partners and family members included in the process, particularly for IRCEs. Um, but I could see where this might be relevant to ACF in Iraq as well. Um, do you work with men either alone or in mixed gender groups to discuss SGBB and its drivers? Um, anything that you might want to share about that? If I may go first, uh, uh, for, from IRSC's is approach, primarily we're looking at integrated groups because as we know from the BSLA, they are self-selected and most cases we have, of course, uh, a huge representation of women, but there are always some men 
a few of them. And uh, the, the idea is actually for the, for the women that are in those groups also to invite their spouses. Primarily we target the spouses, of course, to control the numbers in the discussions. But we, are, we also, one of the main view is also to encourage the men or the, the, even the females to cascade the message to other male members of the household. So we, we really, uh, uh, with the ease, we target both. And we, we encourage the, the interaction. I saw another question whether we also you know, address SGBV on the male side. Yes, it's a discussion. So it could be, uh, you know, SGBV against men or against women. And all is covered with that discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Lara, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I can I can uh, I can tell you about uh, some of the experience very quickly. Uh, when at which time we intervene uh, with a male partner or with male uh, member of family uh, in in Iraq, uh, both in KRI and uh, in uh, in uh, in federal Iraq, we experience situation in which family uh, after the first uh, agreement in uh, letting the the girl the girl the woman participating to the project um, refuse to to let them uh, uh, let her go outside and, and coming for example to the training or or to the to the to the company where he, she was uh, she was hired so we had to intervene at family level uh, via via the the, the, the livelihoods uh, technicians and the psychosocial office uh, psychosocial worker in order to convince and uh, uh, convince and uh, again agree with the family uh, to uh, to let her go so it, it, this was done uh, in, in different phases, different uh, during different visit, but at the end of the day uh, worked. So from this, the 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 the, the, the takeaway of uh, engaging more and more with families and uh, and with male members of the family. Thank you. Oh yes, Alexandra, please. No, yes, and just to complete what, what Lara said, something that I haven't mentioned is that for the MHPSS part, we are also uh, providing uh, awareness sessions at community level, uh, sometimes in mixed groups, sometimes in separate group groups. So this is also the occasion to sensitize uh, men and women on different aspects of mental health and uh, protection uh, before joining the project. Great, thank you. Um, we will move on to another set of questions, including from Paul Cook, which is talking about scale and how do we reach a critical mass of people in the affected communities to cause a change in the environment that is creating these mental health and psychosocial challenges. Um, maybe I'll invite Alexandra and Lara to talk first and then um, Benson or Brian, if you have more to add. Well, I can start. I don't know, Paul, if this will answer completely, completely your question. Uh, but uh, in Iraq, uh, we also have the strategy uh, to strengthen the mental health system in collaboration with the MOH, uh, trying to address causes and consequences of uh, MHPSS and protection issues, uh, and to be able to absorb the shocks, huh, like the refugees in flux, uh, IDPs. Uh, Ministry of Education and Ministry of Labor are also involved and we conduct community-based emergency projects uh, beside uh, this integrated uh, approach. So there are a lot of linkages, coordination and partnerships with um, established with partners and community-based organization and we expect this approach to allow some stability for uh, stabilization for uh, employability and uh, MHPSS access. Thank you. IRC, do you want to add anything or we can move on? Okay, we can move on. <laughs> <laughs> so just to add, um, we have kind of, I'd say, um, a, a strategy, CRS works through national partners um, and so we've really worked at building the skill sets of the staff that are employed by the national partners so that they can continue um, to use those skills moving forward even when the project ends. Um, the other strategy that we've also had has been working 
um, in alliance with government and institutions. So in El Salvador, we've been working um, in the prison system with the general directorate for, uh, for prisons and working with the staff that work there to build up their skills for replication, as well as then um, we have an agreement with the National Vocational uh, Training Institute that oversees all vocational training throughout the country. And they implement their programs through partners. And so we um, have been working with those partner institutions um, to incorporate better skill sets among the staff again um, through that network. So that's allowing us to um, reach a much larger scale, but then also look at building more sustainable practices through um, the staff that are involved in those programs. Thank you, Kay. That actually ties in really well to a question from Claire Inyatowski, which is about how these efforts might be sustained by local stakeholders. Um, if ACF or uh, IRC want to add anything on that. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Um, I think in regards to the sustainability bit, again, for IRC, we, we actually do coordinate the GBV subcluster and uh, as part of this role, we are building capacity of uh, you know, local authorities or on, on, on GPV issues and also you know resolution of uh, you know cases that relate to GPV survivors, uh, but also ensuring that there is you know coordination among us GPV partners within uh, you know project locations so that there is an integrated uh, approach to, to 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 tackle GPV issues. So by having you know, state and county structures and, you know, community case workers that are uh, helping in reporting and, you know, monitoring of, of, of cases, uh, you know, groups of men who are champions uh, to their communities on GPV, you know, uh, awareness. This means, you know, there will be structures that will continue to, to, uh, to function beyond the project. Over. Great, thank you so much. Um, changing tactics a little bit, um, there was a question in terms of how do we define acceptable work? I think particularly for those of you who are working on job placements, so CRS and ACF perhaps in particular. Thanks, Laura. Uh, I already answered the questions on the chat, in the question chat, but I can share that by these. Here, right here, right. we were uh, oper operational side uh, using the the definition that we use was like having access to the, the minimum legal wage mm -hmm. and having access as well with the uh, uh, labor, sorry, the health uh, insurance or the social public services, having a contract that ensures the minimum uh, number of hours and it doesn't exceed as well. And also have in, in our countries uh, also a legal uh, requirement is having access like a retirement fund that varies quite different between countries because we work in Honduras and El Salvador, but that was pretty much having access to at least three of those or two of those categories were the way that we were using for measuring acceptable work. Thank you. Um, going to another question, um, which is uh, specifically for ACF about the business grants and why they are done in two tranches. I answered, of course, on the on the chat, but uh, it, it's simple. It's simple. Uh, when we uh, agreed with the receiver about the grants, we sign an agreement, and the agreement falls in two tranches. Uh, in order to um, monitor uh, the expenses uh, uh, and track the expenses first to, to, to be sure that the, the receiver is also accountable to certain guidelines and agreements. It's part of the, of the, of, of the same training and the same coaching, by the way. Um, and so uh, after, after the, 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 the control, the check of the 
the, the, the justification, the financial justification, we provide the second tranche. It's a, it's, it's a way to accompany and to, uh, to coach uh, to, towards accountability, <laughs> basically. And, and this is the only, the only reason behind. Thank you, Lara. Um, I'd like to bring up another question now from Sarah Ward, which uh, was to CRS, but perhaps also to ACF um, and perhaps IRC if you have employment placement, um, which is talking about the importance of those post-graduation services um, and accompaniment after placement in an apprenticeship or in a job, um, pointing out that this is often something of a, a missing link um, and how to make that happen in a sustainable way. I yeah, I, I think- uh, Okay, please, please, Kate. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, especially in youth workforce development programs, um, everyone measures success by the number of young people that graduate. And um, if we don't start to move towards looking at success based on placement afterwards and the longevity and the quality of that placement, um, we're just going to continue to see success, um, you know, based on something that uh, maybe actually just a really good way of using your free time. And I don't think we can uh, continue to afford to look at things that way. Um, so, and it really helps our programs be much more honest in how well they're actually doing and connecting to the labor market um, by looking at the placement rate. In our case, uh, uh, it's a bit different because our graduation uh, ceremony generally is is carried out at the end of the program, meaning at the end of, at the completion of the fourth month, four month uh, job placement. We, we accompany and we do the job placement within the companies and we continue to follow up the, the, during the four months, uh, the, the delivery of the, of the internal training, the coaching, the finalization of the contract. Uh, the only things that we do generally after five months, and so after the, 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 the end of the project is this uh, um, performance rate. Uh, and generally we do have, as I said, generally up to 17, 16% of people still engaged in the same company or in another company. So we do have only this kind of uh, way of monitoring. Uh, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's more complex where, uh, where there is not a, a really vivid uh, market environment and, and company environment uh, uh, able to absorb additional, uh, in a, uh, able to absorb those people uh, uh, inside. But, but this is already in the context of Iraq, uh, enough a success in our opinion. I hope I answered. Thank you. Um, to go to a slightly different question, which is from Carla Kamatsuji, asking about how each of the programs measures an improvement in psychosocial well-being. Um, I wonder if we might ask the IRC first. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, basically, in, in, in our project, we do both, you know, baseline and headline uh, surveys. Uh, and during this, uh, you know, surveys, we are engaging women groups, of course, having focus group discussions with women groups as well, uh, and, and youths. And so the measure of how you know, one feels that their well-being is has been improved is really dependent on responses during those uh, those assessments, uh, and we can we can be able to determine to you know what proportion of the targeted beneficiaries uh, attribute to that. Of course, a deep dive into why they feel so is often done in regards to what components of the project contributed to their well-being. Over. 
just to add a little bit, I've also pasted a, a, a report uh, in the chat, which can give a little bit more detail on how we approach that question. Thank you. And one call of Sir Kay, do you have anything more to add on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think that like the concept of well-being is kind of broad. Uh, we will have been more focused on particular soft skills or life skills uh, that we have been trying to measure. As well, it, 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 it has been challenging as well. We have been using some standardized tests like uh, some uh, scales related to depression, also scales to ability to solve problems, and also scales to, uh, related to, to resilience. What has been very interesting for us, I didn't show uh, any results related to that, but we have seen that the, the, the higher scores or the higher improvement, we have seen those participants who were at the bottom at the baseline values. So we're seeing better improvement in those participants who were, uh, who were most affected, I would say, at the beginning of the program. And so, uh, those are this is kind of the, the approach that we have been using, and as well, we have also been trying to document as much as possible the some qualitative information that the participants are are, sh are showing or sharing after completing the program. They are, as I mentioned in my presentation, they are highlighting the relevance of building a strong relationship among them and also with the, the their trainers among the most important relevant assets that they got after program completion. Over. So, Laura, just to add real quick to that. Um, so um, in the project that Juan Carlos has been working on, it, it's included uh, the resilience scales, uh, depression scales, and strength and weaknesses um, scales. In the prison work that we have, uh, the evaluation that's gone on there has incorporated nine different psychosocial um, scales to try and evaluate the impact of the I Am Ready Cognitive Behavioral Curriculum there. So there's um, respect for authority. There's, uh, I can't remember all of them off at my hand right now, but one is the emotional regulation. Uh, and I, I think it's just, the challenge of trying to figure out how to evaluate this quantitatively um, with populations that are very mobile um, is also, uh, that's a whole other basket of worms. Um, so, yeah. Absolutely. Um, Alexander, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, yes, uh, about uh, the measurement of uh, impact uh, in AACF, uh, AAH, uh, we developed uh, manuals of uh, indicators uh, and uh, we are contributing at international level as well uh, with clusters or uh, WHO to establish what are the most relevant, let's say, uh, validated academic scales. Uh, so, uh, as for example, um, we are using uh, the HADS, uh, Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale. We are using the WHO5. We are using um, uh, the SRQ20, enfin, very different scales adapted to the public uh, for children, uh, adolescents, and uh, adults. So, we tailor all our uh, monitoring um according uh, to uh, validated uh, tools uh, and referring particularly to uh, mental health thank you we also had a question um pointing out the fact that in a lot of countries there is a lack of trained psychologists of social workers and so on and asking about how do each of your organizations train your staff to provide psychosocial support, um, about what do we do with referrals if there are not enough services to which to refer them, um, or maybe innovative solutions such as um, telehealth or mobile therapy or support groups. Um, I will open this up, whoever might like to talk first. Alexandra, sure. Yes, uh, sorry again. Yes, this is a real issue, of course. Huh? Uh, the budget for uh, mental health in many countries uh, is very low. 
uh, in uh, AAH, uh, we are. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, I just have a little uh, problem. Yes, we are addressing uh, the four, the four uh, levels of the IAS pyramid. So where it's feasible, we are recruiting national uh, psychologists. Uh, otherwise, when it's not feasible, we are working uh, psychosocial workers, meaning educated people uh, willing uh, to, to help uh, with relational skills. Uh, and we train them uh, deeply, we supervise them uh, weekly uh, on case studies uh, and so on. Uh, we are working sometimes with universities as well uh, to try um, to improve their uh, curriculum uh, or to see uh, where you don't have a psychological department, uh, where and how you can uh, create uh, some um, mental health courses. Uh, I think that partnering with a community-based organization is a key always because you can invest in these structures. And once you start to train them, uh, they are um, available uh, and able to provide uh, community uh, support uh, as well. Uh, and regarding our uh, training, we always uh, train uh, our psychologists and psychosocial uh, workers, uh, not only on basic helping skills uh, for uh, psychosocial support, but also on a specialized uh, psychological uh, intervention, including uh, psychotraumatology, for example. Thank you. Brian or Benson or Kay or Juan Carlos, do you want to add? Sure. So um, we work, the staff that we work with, our partner staff, um, go through a training process uh, that includes uh, recommendations around psychological first aid. A lot of the staff that are delivering um, the training programs, they're not, not psychologists, some of them are, um, but our programs are designed uh, in such a way that, you know, we work with the pool of national staff that's that's available um, and then developing kind of support groups among those staff. I think one of the best experiences over this last year um, has been actually what we've saw going on in some of the prisons. Um, prisons have been closed down and so um, we haven't been able to um, participate there but because we had been doing a training program with uh, inmates, they were able to continue replicating some of the content um, and training program that we had been doing. So I think um, just really empowering participants as well to be able to replicate, be those young people, women um, in self-help groups and, and others so that um, they can continue to provide that kind of first line support. I'm, I'm just very briefly from our side. Um, psychosocial support is heavily embedded in our protection work. Uh, we have a fully fledged protection team, especially women protection, that uh, supports our livelihoods work. Myself and Benson are livelihoods um, uh, best, and then we work closely with our protection team. And of course, heavily uh, capacity building is a big component right from the case workers up to the uh, national GBV responders, across the board, we, we, we have to train and uh, strengthen systems. That, as Benson mentioned, we, we co-host the GBV cluster, so that's part of uh, uh, why we are in that position. Great, thank you so much. Um, there was uh, a little bit related to that, a question from Julie Kohler about how the COVID crisis this year has perhaps forced the different projects to adapt. Um, Kay, I think that was an excellent example where you talked about how um, folks inside prisons are actually still continuing to replicate it. Um, uh, ACF or um, IRC, if you want to share any of your program adaptations, um, because of course, addressing psychosocial support needs is even more difficult if you can't congregate in groups. 
for the livelihoods activities uh, actually in Iraq we went through a period in which there was a full lockdown so we could not uh, for a period uh, uh, carried out uh, any activities but now uh, exactly with the OFDA and uh, another GIZ program, uh, we are uh, again on, on track. And so uh, the adaptation uh, went through the physical distancing, uh, adapting the, the, the training uh, places, venues, and, uh, and uh, regular type of uh, such type of uh, uh, adaptation. Uh, while uh, maybe for psychosocial support, we had an uh, ad hoc intervention and maybe Alexander in terms of monitoring uh, uh, the psychosocial, uh, from a so psychosocial uh, point of view, uh, can, can tell you something. I mean, if the point is, uh, can we share these guidelines? We are still editing them, so... At a certain point, uh, yes, we can uh, share, but uh, we still need to uh, improve a little bit uh, according to lessons learned. Thank you. And um, IRC, do you want to share any of your program adaptations due to COVID? Yes, if I may go. Um... When we look at the three components of the ETH approach, luckily for us, um, by the time COVID hit, we had already established the VSLA select groups, so they were already running, and we had started some of the modules in the discussion series, as well as for the business skills training. So one of the things we had to do, of course, we took a, a big pause when everything was uh, closed down, but eventually we started uh, pulling smaller numbers. Uh, and that was a little bit tricky, especially getting the, uh, you know, getting the women and men together. So initially, if you are targeting ten members, then now you have twenty already. So that was a, a bit of a, a bit of a challenge. But that's that's how we managed to 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 go through uh, the modules that we had by reducing on the numbers and of course enforcing the SOPs and the like uh, because. Uh, for us, the program was actually ending in the middle of the year, which was really the peak of the um, of the pandemic, and so we had to to really find a way of passing on the message and ensuring um, that with small numbers we can still uh, pass on the message and encourage them to to engage. Uh, of course, for South Sudan, not so much of the digital uh, learning could be applied because of access, but uh, we managed with smaller groups to to continue the training. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and unfortunately, we are at time. There were a number of other excellent questions from the listeners. So thank you, everybody who participated. Um, and an incredible thank you to all of our panelists, to Brian and Benson, Lara, Alexandra, Juan Carlos, and Kay. And of course, thank you to the Market Links team. Um, I will pass it to Lori to close. Thank you, Laura. Uh, thank you to you and to all of our speakers. And thank you to everyone who took the time to join us for this webinar today. I hope you found the discussion informative and useful for your work. Uh, we'll be posting a recording of this webinar on Market Links in a few days. Um, in, that, in the meantime, uh, you can find resources related to the webinar on the Market Links website in the event post about this webinar. Um, thank you again, everyone, and have a great day.